Cancer. Medicine. <laughs> Science. Please welcome to the stage, Daniel Lawrence Abrams. Uh, curing cancer? I can follow that. <laughs> Sports can save politics. Now, I'm not talking about settling policy debates with a boxing match, and I'm not talking about setting tax policy with a dunking contest, although that might make the selection process for VP slightly more interesting. Instead, I'm talking about, number one, a system of objective, consistent, verifiable measures, and number two, a culture that embraces acknowledging a loss. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of background on me, so if you're watching this online, just go ahead and scroll ahead about 70 seconds, and I'll give you a heads up. People in the audience are going to have to stick with me for the uh, 70 seconds. Um, so I like to take partial credit for the poker boom, uh, credit or blame, depending on if you like poker or not. Uh, in 1998, poker was doing so poorly on TV that ESPN stopped airing it, and in 1999, um, Steve Lipscomb produced the World Series of Poker for the Discovery Channel, and it did well enough that they wanted to do it again in 2000, but he was busy, so he brought me in to produce it. And I'm a poker nerd, so I produced the World Series of Poker based on some very nerdy poker books. And from those books, I started thinking about poker analytically and using metrics and measures to help understand the game theory and understand the nuances of the game. So I wanted to bring that to television because I thought, you know, what television needs is more statistics. But <laughs> believe it or not, it actually worked out pretty nicely. Uh, I, the little running stats to show who was in the lead as each card fell gave insight into uh, which player made the right decision and which player made the wrong decision, although sometimes both players can make the right decision. And these running stats were so popular that ESPN got back in the poker on TV business and it just took off from there. So I like to take a little bit of partial credit for the poker boom. Now, what that resulted in, in this measures and, and quantification, is a better educated uh, player base. And anyone who's played poker since 2000 has recognized how much tougher these players are to beat because they're just not making as many sucker moves, as many stupid decisions. Understanding the nuances and the specifics makes a difference, gives you a better understanding. Okay, so stop scrolling here. If you're scrolling online, stop scrolling here. Uh, I'm gonna get momentarily grandiose. The most important pursuit is that of truth. The other pursuits, happiness, justice, money, they'll all come if we stop deceiving ourselves. Um, but unfortunately, in politics, deception has become acceptable. All the political parties spin. That's Democrats, Republicans, and all the fringe parties. It's become standard. Now, some spin more than others, but we all are subject to our own biases, and we rarely challenge our own assumptions, and therefore, we almost never challenge our own conclusions. We're safe in our bubbles. We assume that we're well-informed because we watch so much news or we read so much online, but we're always checking our favorite sources, almost by definition. Very few of us sample outside of our safe bubble and check our opponent's sources firsthand. Well, maybe we'll watch a clip of our opponent's sources on our favorite source, but very few of us will check the actual opponent source. Now, information must be processed well, so I'm going to propose some metrics, and I will try to be nonpartisan. This is your last chance to stop scrolling. You're going to miss the good parts. The only way to always be right is to be capable of changing your mind. Now, you can delude yourself into thinking that you're right if you just never experience outside information. But we all make mistakes. We're all human. No one knows everything. As we encounter more information, we naturally come up with different decisions and different conclusions and change our minds and evolve, and that's good. Because that's the only way to get smarter is to be prepared to disregard and throw out uh, the old philosophies that don't hold true based on the new facts. Now, how can sports be used? Now, sports is great because it's tribal, it's competitive, and most importantly, it has a quantifiable, objective reality to it. Okay, now let's talk about, let's say you're a huge Lakers fan, okay? Been one your entire life, so is your whole family. You can't stand the Knicks, and the Knicks are coming to town. Well, you may think the Knicks stink, but if the Knicks score 104 points and the Lakers score 
84 points, even the most diehard Lakers fan is going to admit that the Knicks won. You won't have groups of Lakers fans saying, oh, no, no, Lakers actually won. <laughs> Thank God. Um, and you also won't see them getting spun by like a local biased sports anchor saying, well, we won because we have the best weather. Or we won because the Lakers girls are the, are, are the hottest cheerleaders in, in all of sports. That may be true, but it's not relevant to whether the team was better. Sports news, Sports Center, the best among them, gets the stories right. And part of the reason why sports news is so accurate is because people check the source material. If, if Sports Center gives a wrong score, you can go watch the game and tally up the score and know if they were wrong or not. And they just won't tolerate lies or won't tolerate deceptions. So that's very valuable in sports news, and I think we should apply that to politics. Now, evaluating coaches works the same way. I'll give you an example. Michael Singletary was the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers in the 2010-2011 season, and he was getting crushed with like a 5-10 and 10 record. Then Jim Harbaugh took over, and he kicked butt with a 13-3 and three record with basically the same team. Now, most people would recognize that Harbaugh was the better coach, objectively, by isolating the variable, using the scientific method that sports uses as a matter of course. But now I want you to imagine an alternate universe where the systems are switched. In sports, you still have a clock, but there's no set scoring. There's no measures. The viewers vote to decide the winner. And part of the game is campaigning for why your team won and why your opponent's team lost. It's ridiculous. Consequently, you would never see in such a parallel universe, I mean, if you had a parallel universe where you would have unprincipled uh, campaigners saying things like, well, our field goals should count as 20 points each because we scored three of them, and our opponent's touchdowns, they scored five of them, they should only be worth one point each. But then in a different game, say, oh, well, we scored five touchdowns, and they should be worth 30 points each, and our opponent scored 12 field goals, and those should only be worth a tenth of a point each. Like, you would never have shifting criteria. It's just ludicrous. And yet politics has shifting criteria all the time. So what I propose is a system for each individual user to be able to tailor the scoring of a politician or political party or political ideology. Now, the system could be complicated. There could be 20 such systems. Paging Nate Silver, 538.com, I think he'd be perfect for this if you happen to be watching. Um, and in this website user experience, you would first select the measures. The, the way the user would use it is they'd select whichever measures were important to them, whether it was uh, GDP per capita, inflation, tax rates, unemployment. You select the measures that matter to you. I'm not saying everybody has to have the same measure. I'm saying, Everyone can have their own measure, but just don't change the criteria. Use that measure and then check the past 30 years of presidents or the past 30 years of Congress. Don't keep changing the game so that your tribe wins. Politics should be about truth and not tribalism. So, so you select your measures, then you define your scoring method, including lag time, because clearly a president should only be measured by which the policies he actually enacts. You know, if a president takes office, that day and there's some international crisis, you can't blame that president the day he takes office. Um, after he's been in office some amount of time, up to the individual, then you can start measuring how he was able to affect that policy positively or negatively. And then finally, there's the weighting systems. Some of you might not care at all about inflation. Some of you might not care about unemployment. Some of you might not care about the environment. Some of you might not care about uh, tax rates. Pick the criteria that are right for you. So one example for unemployment, just to get a little specific, high unemployment is bad, low unemployment is good. Maybe you structure it so that if unemployment goes up one percentage point compared to the previous president, um, you lose a point. And if you were able to drop unemployment rate compared to the previous president, you get a point. And the exact scoring is utterly secondary compared to the fact that we need to have some sort of standard set criteria. Um, each person can have different criteria, uh, but not different criteria for each game or each episode or each campaign. The big danger is complete fraud. Now, some of the fact-checking websites, Snopes.com is excellent, 
factcheck.org, PolitiFact, they have their functions and uses. But we need to have a system that has scoring to take it to the next level. We need to stop fooling ourselves. Thank you very much.